Well, tonight we're going to be in the 8th chapter of the book of Luke, if you want to follow along there. Uh, tonight we're going to be dealing with a subject uh, that I think is, uh, it's, it's going to be eye-opening for some. I think it's going to be a, we're going to deal with a subject tonight that may let you learn a little bit about people, about yourself maybe. I'm going to start by saying that salvation is a journey, it has a beginning, it has a, a middle, and it has an ending. Uh, sadly uh, and, and, and erroneously, we often think about salvation as only a beginning. You know, we talk about it in church all the time, uh, come and be saved, come and be born again, accept Jesus as your Savior, be baptized, and start your your journey with the Lord. And, and the, it does, like any story, it has to have a good beginning, and that's. But also, you need to realize it is only a beginning. It uh, there's a whole lot more to it than just starting. You have to finish. Uh, too often, people have come to believe that just a one quick trip to the altar and that's got you ready for heaven. And 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 it that's how it starts. It really does. It has that beginning. We accept uh, God. We repent of our sin. We receive the Holy Spirit into our life. And, and this beginning, we become public about our faith. And we let everybody see about what we plan to do by our words, our deeds, and our baptism. But let me say it like this so that there won't be a question about it. The Bible teaches that salvation takes a lifetime to work out. All right, It starts, but it takes a lifetime to, be, to work its way out. I, I mean, it's like this. I'm saved. I'm being saved. And I will be saved. You understand? That's how that is. I, I'm, I'm saved. I'm being saved. And I will be saved. It's a, a journey. Salvation that is real and genuine. Now, this is very important. Salvation that is real and really, really genuine is salvation that finishes well as well as starts well and has a, a good middle. In other words, it, it's important that you not get started down the journey of salvation with the Lord and, and stop or go sideways with it. It's important that you go all the way through. This past week, we watched the Olympics. Did anybody get to watch the Olympics? And uh, we watched those runners. Uh, most of them never stopped before they got to the finish line, right? Yeah. Once in a while, somebody would stumble and fall, but every time, if they're going to run that race, they went all the way to the tape. They wouldn't stop till they got there. Um, those who ran fast at the end were the winners. So just keep in mind that salvation is a journey. It is uh, a, a work of God, but it is a journey, and it, it, uh, it's more than just a good beginning. And let's start and read first uh, chapter 8. We'll start with verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Hutza, the manager of <clears throat> Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus <clears throat> from town after town, he told them this parable. Now, let's just stop a moment and, and let you kind of catch up to where we are. What's going on? What, what, uh, why, that's, why things are happening as they happen. As often I've told you, when we begin to deal with a text and we begin to see what God has to say to us from it, one of the most important things we can ever do is find out the context. Find out what's going on. Why is what's happening happening? What's being said? And who's listening? And who's hearing it? Because if you don't, you'll, you'll, get, uh, you'll take the Bible and you'll make it say things it doesn't intend to say and you'll miss some great points that it has to teach us. So let's see if we can find out what the background of this is. So Jesus is on an itinerant preaching uh, tour. He's going from town to village all around the area. He's preaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. That's his message. He's saying to the people, the kingdom of God has come. And, and it is here. And, and you can be a part of it. And often I've told you how you become part of the kingdom of God is you make Jesus king. 
right? That's how you get in the kingdom of God. So he was telling him that. The 12 were with him. Uh, we are confident at this point that that was the disciples that we know of, the 12 that were traveling with him. Uh, and some women were also traveling with him. Let's meet these ladies. We know the men, but let's meet the ladies that were traveling with Jesus. Mary called Magdalene. Uh, she is from the town of Magdala. So it's Mary from the town of Magdala. All right, that's how that works out. So they call in the ancient world that they just put her town in with her name and she's called Mary Magdalene and she had been healed of a of demon possession. Seven demons had been uh, exercised out of her life and she had been healed. Then we meet the wife, then we meet Joanna. Joanna, she is the wife of Husa. And who is this? This is Herod's. Now this is very important. Herod, it was his household manager's wife. Right? The household manager of Herod, King Herod. So she was traveling with Jesus as well. That was kind of a shocker to me to see that someone of that stature and that and that standing in the community was traveling with Jesus. And uh, she was Hutza's uh, household manager. And then Susanna and others, there, there were other women in this crowd. And so without going into great detail and, and boring you with uh, uh, with things that you could go look up on your own. Uh, let's move on. These women, uh, the Bible says very clearly, were financially supporting the missionary trip. The women were paying for the trip out of their own resources. And so Jesus was letting them uh, use their own personal resources to buy their food. I don't know what the expenses they might have, but the ladies were supporting the ministry that, that, that Jesus was was going from town to town. I thought that was kind of an insight, kind of interesting. And people were coming to Jesus from each village in town to hear him speak. They were just pouring out of those villages and uh, coming to hear what he had to say. And you can imagine how uh, how much interest was get was growing from town to town as people were saying, "Jesus is here," and he healed the sick, he raised the dead. He, you know, we just saw him in the last time we. We're in this in the, in the chapter 7. He raised a boy back to life, a young man. He gave him back his life. And we saw a lot of this ha happening, and word is spreading all over. And, that, and people are coming. Now, if you are at a point in your life where you can hear the salvation story, and you're ready to make a commitment to Jesus to live by that, I'm going to tell you, you're in the best place you could possibly ever be. You are in a great place if you're ready to make a lifelong commitment to following Jesus. And, and tonight, the, the message is going to be dealing with how we hear the message, how we receive the message of Christ, what we do with it, how we put it to work, how we begin, how we have the middle, how we end it. We're all going to be dealing with all of that in one fell swoop tonight. Now, there are natural and there are supernatural reasons to explain why different people react differently to the gospel message. There are natural reasons and there are supernatural reasons. <clears throat> there are reasons that come from material uh, human concerns and then there are some that are supernaturally uh, engaging in our life that keep us from doing what we need to do. In fact, I think the devil will come often and and uh, will discourage people from following the Lord. But there also, the discouragement comes from families and friends and, and associates. You know, there are lots of natural and there are supernatural reasons for following the Lord and why some people don't follow the Lord. So why is the Word of God received differently? Why does, do some people hear it and they just take it hook, line, sinker, and they make a lifelong commitment and they follow the Lord every day of their life all the way to the end. And then some people just don't. They don't get it. They don't accept it. They don't understand it. Or why is it some do and some don't? I think tonight this sermon will give you some insight into your own life, but it will also give you some some insight into the lives of people that you are trying to influence for the kingdom of God. From, from people that you're trying to witness and, and bring to faith in Christ. And, and I want you tonight to listen to the Holy Spirit as He unpacks this sermon for you because 
you, you can learn a great deal about yourself and about others tonight. So let's begin and answer that difficult question of why some people receive the gospel differently than others by starting there in verse 5. I want to, before we get here, I want to tell you that there are natural things, but also uh, some things uh, are not natural. Well, let's, let's read verse 5. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Now this is Jesus telling a parable. And uh, this parable is going to explain or answer the question that we're asking. So this a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seeds fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than, than was sown. Some people hear the message of Jesus Christ. They hear the gospel. They hear the good news that they can be saved, that they can have a new start, a second chance. They hear that wonderful story. And they, they want it so bad. They are so hungry for it. But it gets beaten down and trampled on by people in their lives. They'll, they'll come to Christ and then they'll go home and tell their family. And their family will say, oh, that's silly. Why do you want to do that for you? You're wasting your time. Why don't you give up on that church stuff, that Jesus stuff? You know, eh, I don't know. They'll, they'll, they will talk it down. They will, in, they will discourage the people from, from following the Lord. Some people that get the truth trampled on by the people in their lives. And I know many of you have experienced that. Uh, it, it, and I hope that, that you're never the one that discourages an, another. We, You know, the Bible says that to discourage one of these little ones, it would be better if you had a millstone tied around your neck and throw it into the ocean than to discourage one of these little ones. Now, that's what Jesus meant by that. When you discourage someone from taking their, their, their journey with the Lord, it's a dangerous thing. But then some people, and that's a natural, some people are supernaturally hindered because Satan lies to them. He will lie to them and tell them uh, a supernatural lie that says Jesus is not the Son of God or, or you didn't get saved or you're not worthy of being saved or, you know, all kinds of, but, but he will come. And, the, and that story we read by, uh, by what these birds came and ate. Now many times, we'll, we'll talk on that a little bit more. Many times, Truth comes into people's lives and they acknowledge it of God, as God's Word, but it gets lost in the complexity and the busyness of life. How many of you are, are living very complex lives? How many of your lives are complex? Mine is. How many of you are living busy lives? Yeah. Anybody busy? <laughs> Did you know that busyness is not a really good thing for a Christian? We're not supposed to be too busy. Did you know that? In fact, we get so busy, I get tickled. I've done this for years. When somebody asks, I say, what you been doing? They say, oh, we've been so busy, thinking that's a good thing. Well, for a Christian, busyness is, can't even be a distraction from doing the best things. So don't be proud of being busy. Be proud of following the Lord and, and doing what He wants. Well, it's because uh, some people, they, they, they get lied to. Sometimes their life gets so complex of it there and they get lost. And, and the truth of God just gets crowded out. I mean, it, it's good. They're excited about it. Oh, they, they love to hear the message of Jesus, the hope that they have. But it goes to, you plug it into your life and you've got ball games and you've got dance lessons and you've got school and you've got ball, you know, you got practices and, and you got all that, got to go to the doctor and then you got all this stuff and you, you know, it's pretty soon it just gets crowded out. Well, thankfully there are some who are ready to receive it and there are good people around to water and cultivate this newfound truth. I want us to be a church that waters and cultivates when people come to the Lord. I want us to be somebody that that it, that when somebody comes to Jesus, that we take them and put our arm around them and we walk with them through their journey. And not just a, a short journey, but all the way through. 
Well, let me move on and, and let's go on to the rest of verse 8 because some people just aren't ready for the changes that salvation is going to bring. Now, whenever a person gets saved, please listen to this. You get changed. And I've said this so many times, and I, uh, you've got to hear this. If you didn't get changed, if, if you weren't different after you met the Lord than you were before you met the Lord, you didn't meet the Lord. Okay? You might have met somebody, but you didn't meet Jesus because when He comes into our lives, He begins a process of changing us. And it's not miraculous overnight sort of stuff. But little by little, moment by moment, you'll look back after a, a few months or years and you'll realize, you know what, I'm different. I'm not like I used to be. I'm not great. I'm not perfect. But I'm better. I'm, I'm moving in the right direction. So some people just aren't ready for the changes that salvation is going to bring in their life. And they think about, well, if I come to Christ, I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to quit that. I'm going to have to go here. I'm going to have to stop going there. So... They just aren't ready for the changes. Let's read this, the last part of verse 8. And when he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. And he said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. Now let me read that to you out of a different translation. A more accurate, I think, English translation, because it'll make more sense to you. <clears throat> His disciples asked him, why did you tell us this story? He said, you've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. There are others who need stories, but even with stories, some of them aren't going to get it. Their eyes are open, but don't see a thing. Their ears are open, but they don't hear a thing. Quite honestly, folks, some people just don't get it. Some folks just don't get it. When you tell them the gospel, it's the gospel is not good news to them. For some reason, they just don't get it. They don't. They think they don't need it, uh, or they think they're better than that, or I don't know. There's a million different reasons, and you have to kind of kind of find your own. But some people just don't get it. They hear the story of Jesus. But it doesn't mean anything to them. <clears throat> they don't accept it. Because we, we haven't been to heaven yet, have we? And we're not sure about hell either. And so we think, well, I don't know about heaven. I don't know about hell. I, I, maybe I don't need salvation. I don't want to go through all this religious stuff because I don't believe it anyway. I mean, that's kind of what they're saying. So they hesitate. Well, we're all on a journey. And often... We're not at the place of acceptance. But wisdom cries out to us. Wisdom cries out to us. Open your ears and hear. Open your eyes and see the things that Jesus have, has come to tell us. But some people, they just don't get it. All right. So that's the second reason. Now the third reason is, and this one is what I told you we're going we're gonna to go back and deal with this a little bit more because there are supernatural explanation, explanations for people who will walk away from salvation. They're supernatural. Let's read Luke 8, 5. I'm kind of taking it out of order here. Go to Luke 8, 5 now. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and it was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. The birds ate it up. Well, that's, we get it. I mean, now we all understand what that's like. We, we know that birds will come and eat the seed, and, and they won't germinate. So, well, who is this bird that eats the seed? Well, the forces of evil are going to do all that they can do to keep a person from salvation. The devil's going to do everything he can to keep you and your friends from salvation. He's going to try to discourage you and cause you to drop out in the middle of your journey. He's going to try to uh, get your friends to, to be discouraged and to not, to not accept Christ. You see, there's the more a person is exposed to to the works of the devil, the more this removal of truth can happen. And some people's lives are so open to the, the to evil. Some people are so engaged in it, they're 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 inundated in in evil and, and anger and frustration and bitterness and doubt. They're so lost in this that it doesn't take much for the devil to grab those seeds of the gospel that's planted and run off with them. 
it's, it's easy to see. But there's going to come a time on the earth when a great deception is going to be exposed. And, and then, uh, because what, what the Bible tells us about the last days, it says that as we get closer to the end of time, till Jesus comes back, there's going to be more and more of this great deception that goes on, on the earth. It's going to get harder and harder for the gospel seeds to sink into lives. It's going to get harder because the birds, the, the evil forces, are removing that seed so quickly. So what's the cure? The warning is, if you hear God's voice, open your heart and let Him in. If you're here, don't delay. Don't wait. If you're here tonight and you're hearing God's voice, you say, how would I know if I was hearing God's voice? Well, it's not my voice. You'll hear it on the inside. All right? You'll hear it on the inside. He'll be talking to you in your innermost person. It'll, it'll be more of a, a sense of urgency, a sense of, of a concern that you'll feel in your life. And when you feel that, that's God talking to you, directly to you, saying, come, follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Because He wants you in the kingdom of God. He wants to love you. He wants to protect you, care for you, and see that you get to be with Him here and in heaven to come. But... The more you're listening to the people around you and the more you're engaged in evil in this world, the harder it's going to be because the birds are going to eat the seed. So be prepared to make a life-changing commitment to follow Jesus forever and make that commitment without hesitation. Now, let's read verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. So Jesus is going to now interpret His own parable. Remember He said parables... Uh, are, are stories that I tell because some people need to hear it in a story form. And so he says, now, you guys, he was talking to his disciples, he said, you disciples, you get it. You already understand it. But for others, I'm going to tell this story so they'll get it. So Jesus then interprets the story and he said, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those, verse 13, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Do you remember that I said that salvation has a beginning, a middle, and an end? See, it's important that you not quit down the road. It's important that you finish your journey. It's important that you run through the tape at the end of your race, exhausted, <laughs> wrung out because you've left it all. You've done everything for Jesus you could do. And so there's, it's important that we not fall away in a time of testing. And then in verse 14, the seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. The seed simply doesn't germinate and grow. It just fizzles. But the seed in verse, let's go to verse 5 now. <clears throat> but the seed, the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble heart, a good heart. They hear the word, I'm sorry, verse 15. Uh, verse 15, forgive me. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by preserving, or by persevering, by running all the way, they produce a good crop. They produce a good crop because they don't quit. <clears throat> now here's what we need to do. Here's what you need to do. Here's what I need to do. We need to hear the call of God and welcome Him in. We need to say, when we hear His voice, if we hear His voice, harden not your heart. In other words, don't harden up, but soften your heart and, and receive Jesus. Invite Him in. If you hear His voice, welcome Him in to your life. And let nothing prevent your faith from growing strong. Don't let people discourage you. Don't let the evil around you eat remove the seeds from your life. Don't let anything keep you from maturing in your faith. And hold on to the end and persevere and cross the line shouting, Hallelujah. Welcome home. And Jesus says, Welcome home. Faithful servant. You've been faithful. That's all we want to do. Start good. 
Run good, finish good. Now, where are you on your journey? Tonight, I'm speaking to some of you that are about to cross the finish line. Well, people like me, you know, we're, we're, we don't have, we're going to be out of here some of these days. And there's, there's people just now kind of in the middle of your run. You're right in the middle of your journey. How are you doing? Are you running strong? Are you gaining strength? Or are you, uh, is the world pulling you around and kicking you and blowing you where you need, don't need to go? And then I know, also know tonight that there are some people that are at the beginning. Some of you tonight are ready to accept Jesus as your Savior and start your journey. Some of you just have. We've had a lot of people recently who got saved and, and have been baptized in our church. And, and we're getting a long list now of folks that are going to go to the creek with us and, uh, on uh, the Sunday after Labor Day for our, our big baptismal service. And there's a lot of folks just getting started for the Lord. And, and tonight, I want you to know it's so important to start well, but it's also important to, to persevere and to end well. So wherever you are on your journey, we pray for you tonight. We bless you. We encourage you. Hold on. Let nothing drive you away. You come to the Lord. Let's. Page 73. 73.